Following on from the introduction to diversification that I covered in the last episode, including the illustration of the benefits that diversification can produce, this time I asked the question about whether diversification is the golden bullet to managing risk. And by golden bullet, I mean, is it the answer to all of your risk management issues? In particular, I'll be looking at when diversification might not work as well as we'd hoped and explain some of the reasons for this. Because if we know why this is, then it does actually mean we can then take action to improve our approach to diversification. Stay tuned. So last time we looked at some of the reasons why traders choose to implement diversification strategies into their trading routines. And then we went on to look at an example of this. And it was a very simple example that just traded two assets as part of a mini portfolio as opposed to trading them separately and took a look at the difference especially in terms of risk metrics that that technique produced. But this time we tackle the question of whether diversification is the golden bullet and the answer to all of the risk management issues that we face. And I already suggested that wasn't the case, but today we're going to look at some examples of why that's the case and then see what we can do about that to increase the effectiveness of diversification. So let's now take a look at why diversification doesn't provide a solution in all circumstances. Now, although we've already said that this will not be the case, it will, of course, still be a significant contributing factor if done correctly. So just because it isn't a golden bullet doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. So let's now wind back and look at just two examples where diversification will only provide a minimal amount of risk reduction. The first of these is during major financial crises. So for example, in 2008. And the second is simply due to the random nature of price action, even in uncorrelated markets. So let's take a closer look at each of these. Now, of course, one of the asset classes that was affected in a major way by the financial crisis in 2008 was the stock markets. And this is what happened to the S&P 500. And this red area you see on the chart here is 2008. Now, because stock markets tend to be very correlated, and when one market goes up, another tends to go up and vice versa, of course, other markets around the world were impacted in a similar way. And this is the example for the Spanish IBEX 35. But when there is a major financial crisis of this nature, it tends to be other markets that are also impacted. So here we can see the chart for crude oil. And although crude managed to survive the initial part of 2008, it then did see rapid falls in its price. Here's the chart for gold. And again, initially it didn't suffer as much as the stock markets, but then towards the end it did. And this is for an asset that is typically considered to be a safe haven in times of high uncertainty and high risk. And then finally, this is the chart for euro dollar. Now clearly with currency pairs, the situation is different. With all of these other assets, their valuations of a asset or a number of assets in a portfolio. Whereas with any currency pair, that's just purely a ratio between the strength of the currencies in two economies. So we wouldn't expect currency pairs to be affected in the same way. And where some currency pairs would have fallen, others would have actually risen. But the point I want to make here is that for the duration of the 2008 crisis, euro dollar went in one direction. And so there were fundamental forces that were driving that trend. 
But the point here, if you had a diversification strategy that traded multiple of these, then that wouldn't have helped you significantly because during the financial crisis, the price of those assets became correlated, even though during more normal times, they would be more uncorrelated. Now, of course, there are other types of diversification which we're going to study later on in the series, and these other types may well have helped, but more on that later. So let's move on to the second point, which is the random nature of price action. And even in uncorrelated markets, we can still see short-term correlation, which would effectively diminish the effects of our diversification strategy. So let's look at the example of two uncorrelated assets. For simplistic terms, I'm going to ignore times when the markets are flat and just look at those for now where they're going up or down. And so there are four combinations. The first asset could be going up while the second asset can be coming down and then the converse of that. And sometimes they're both going to be going up or both going to be coming down. And because these two assets are uncorrelated, we'd expect to see a similar ratio of time that they were exhibiting these four different combinations. Now, what does this mean? Well, effectively, 50% of these are showing correlated behavior just through pure random chance. Because as we've said, these assets are not fundamentally correlated. And so the point is, if you were holding each of these assets in a portfolio in the same direction, then there are periods of time when that diversification will not give you any benefit at all. And you might say, yes, but I could hold one long and one short. But of course, that wouldn't help because then the other combinations of market mean that diversification wouldn't help you there. Now, there will be other categories, of course, such as when one or both of those markets are in a trading range and the price action is much flatter. But if you think about it, diversification won't help there either. Because while one of these assets is flat and the price isn't going anywhere, the other might still be accruing up drawdown on your account. And the asset that's in a flat market isn't helping to reduce that drawdown during this particular time. So what we can deduce from this is that on average, if you just diversify once, and by that I mean instead of trading just one asset, you start to diversify to trade two assets, then even if those two assets are completely uncorrelated, they can only contribute to reducing the risk in your portfolio a maximum of 50% of the time. But as we've said, in reality, it will actually be less than 50% of the time due to those times when one or both will be in a ranging market. Now, one of the potential options here is that we diversify more. So for example, instead of just trading two assets, we trade three. And the same kind of arguments follow here, where we could now say, well, if we now diversify twice to three assets, even again, if all three of those were completely uncorrelated, this can now only contribute to reducing risk a maximum of 75% of the time. And if you're not quite sure where I've got those percentages from, all will become clear in a future episode when I start to look at the effects of increasing that portfolio. But if we just accept that figure for now, of course, that is a maximum, and in reality, again, it would actually be less than that because of flat markets. And so when I do the episode on increasing diversification, you'll actually see there the calculations that go to contribute to these figures in a lot more detail. So the conclusion that we can come to here is that although diversification is far from being a golden bullet, it is still a very important part of an overall risk management strategy. And in terms of specifically helping to lower the overall portfolio risk, 
it's a critical part. Now this kind of technique, of course, does not help lower the risk associated to individual trades. And this means that you should therefore combine your diversification strategy with individual trade strategies, such as good stop loss management, appropriate position sizing per trade. And of course, you need to avoid over leveraging at all costs. You also need very careful consideration of how to balance your risk across a portfolio and possibly consider other risk reduction practices such as escape rules for your strategy on the basis of economic news releases or potentially price shocks as they occur. Now, next time, we'll start to get into the details of the practicalities of achieving diversification and how you actually implement the necessary rules. So if that episode's already available now, then you'll see that top right. If not, then please do subscribe to be notified when it becomes available. And now, until next time, trade safe.